What's wrong with you? I don't know, man. You know, I guess with Christmas, New Year's, and Magfest, it's just bringing it all back. And every time I think about it, it's like a dagger through my heart. I think it's time you got over it. How can you say that? It's been a year. It's been two weeks. Matt Smith regenerated two weeks ago. <laughs> exactly, it happened last year. And this is your way of cheering me up? Well, we could do a crossover together. No, no crossovers. I don't do crossovers. Well, I, I don't even do reviews anymore. Oh, come on, you owe me. Why? Why do I owe you? I don't know, the constant abuse. Oh, I know Film Brain will be annoyed by this. Well, he will be when he finishes the review. It's funny. Forcing me to watch a porn movie. I'm going to be You enjoyed it. And you did shoot me in the old zombie review. And what better way to go out than by reviewing it with my best friend? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good times. <sighs> no, it wasn't. It really hurt. Well, it was good for me anyway. Okay, what do you want to review? Texas Chainsaw 3D. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre film we saw last year at Magfest. Yes. You figured that was the best way to cheer me up? To remind me of last year at Magfest? Yes. All right, but I'll do it on one condition. Which is? I edit the title sequence. But you almost always edit the title sequence. So it won't be a problem then, will it? Deal. White run, the maidens and the men. We swig our brew until we spew, then we fill our mugs again. You can keep your filthy skooma, it makes our bellies bleed. Cause when we raise our flag into another dead dragon, there is just one drink we need. Nord me. Nord me. You are a troll, aren't you? Yes, I am. Anyway, I don't know why you're acting so surprised. I mean, you did edit this thing, so that really shouldn't have come as a shock to you. But anyway, do you want to start? Okay. Hello and welcome to Bad Movie Day! Whoa, 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 whoa. Um, if you're going to be talking like that the whole way through this review, you'll have to let me know so I can go and schedule bathroom breaks. Can I just start the review, please? Fire away. Hello and welcome to Bad Movie Beatdown, and on this episode, me and Welshie are going to be slicing into Texas Chainsaw 3D. The original Texas Chainsaw is, to me, one of the greatest movies ever put to screen. Inspired by the notorious Ed Gain murders, director Toby Hooper crafted one of the most disturbing and unnerving horror movies ever. Falsely claiming to be a true story, the whole movie has this vibe of a snuff film, thanks to the grainy film stock. And while it is a vicious and unrelenting movie, its effect comes from what it does and show. Instead of detailed depictions of decapitations and sawn off body parts, it lets the audience imagination fill in the blanks, using as little gore as possible. A true horror classic, it created one of the genuine horror icons in Leatherface and Spawn 3 sequels, including one by Hooper himself, a Michael Bay produced remake which I actually didn't mind, save for Leatherface taking off his fucking mask, and a prequel which we both previously reviewed. And the less said about that, the better. Like many horror properties that Platinum Dunes own, they sat on them, or just flat out ruined them, until the rights expired. Twisted Pictures, the company behind the Saw films, bought them and partnered with Lionsgate to do another reboot, but Lionsgate balked at the idea of their planned trilogy. Speaking of Lionsgate and Saw, when are you planning on finishing your Saw retrospective, Welshie? I know where you sleep, Matty, and I suggest if you want to make it through the night, you avoid this line of conversation and never refer to it again. <clears throat> Instead, Lionsgate turned to another frequent production partner, New Image, aka Millennium Films, who have you been following my work and notorious for their B-movie schlock, and I have compared them before now to Canon Films in the 80s. They have something of a spotty history with horror remakes given how they made atrocious versions of Day of the Dead, It's Alive, and infamously The Wicker Man. With Twisted Pictures Carl Mazzucconi producing, this new Texas Chainsaw would be directed by John Lucenhop, who made Tay 
sneakers, and not only cast aside Bay's remakes, but also any Texas Chainsaw sequels by announcing itself as a direct follow-up to the 1974 original in 3D. Never mind the fact that two of the three credited writers' only notable credits are a Val Kilmer director video movie and Jason Goes to Hell the final Friday. Opening on the same weekend Horror Smash the Devil Inside did a year prior and also not screened for critics, the film took advantage of almost no new release competition to become number one at the box office, but it was a much smaller opening than Devil Inside and only just managed to beat Christmas Holdover Django Unchained through the power of 3D surcharges. Also about 20 bucks of that was ours we should say. And like Devil Inside it opened big on Friday and crashed and burned just as quickly, falling from 1st to 9th in its second weekend. But at about $20 million to make, it made just under double at $39 million worldwide, and although rumours spread around release of a follow-up, nothing has been confirmed yet. Hey, remember that review we did of Texas Chainsaw Massacre at the beginning, available now on thatguywiththeglasses.com? Yes? I think people should watch it. Why? Because we're money-hungry assholes and we don't have real jobs. <laughs> yeah. I've got a real job. No, you don't. The film begins with a much better movie, the original 1974 Texas Chainsaw Massacre spliced into an opening montage kill by kill, likely to try and prove this is indeed a follow-up, which has been retrofitted into 3D, you'll be delighted to hear. Can I just point out that to everyone who shat on the original Texas Chainsaw remake for its objectification of Jessica Biel's admittedly fine ass, this shot proves that the original did it first. Know that. Rather interestingly, the filmmakers reshot Marilyn Burns' Sally jumping through the window and fixed the continuity error that caused them in the original, showing an attention to details seldom seen elsewhere. The film starts proper moments after the original concluded, with Sally having escaped Leatherface and presumably having told the police about her friend's encounter with the family. Sheriff Hooper? Ah, I see what they did there. Goes to the house to confront the family, called the Sawyers, a long reference to their surname in Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. So yes, this is still 1973. Remember this for later because it's important. Now, does anyone want to tell me where all these other family members came from? I'm pretty sure there were only four in the original and one of them died at the end of the film. And no, having a bunch of cars appear outside the house and the door closing does not justify all these people suddenly showing up. Ah, it's so we can have loads of cameos. See, the old guy is Gunnar Hansen, the original Leatherface, Drayton is now played by Bill Mosley who was Chop Top in Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, and they've even got John Duggan back in the makeup to play the grandpa again, if you can see him for the two seconds he appears. Well, I guess we can class this as a positive point, I mean the film's clearly supported by the team who brought us the original, and they even got Toby Hooper to do an audio commentary guest spot. Really? They actually got him to do that? See, I wouldn't class this as a positive point, because it makes what follows so much worse. You might even say it's horrible. Hey, Maddie. Hey, yeah. Horrible. Huh? Yeah. You're horrible. Yeah. Also, when we actually see young Leatherface, it looks like his plasky mask from the intro was bought from a Halloween costume shop. Saying that, I really do appreciate the obvious care that went into recreating the original house. Its problem is that due to it being filmed in daylight and not being given the respect it should be considering the actual setting that it's taking place in, it leaves it feeling incredibly cheap and much less intimidating, especially when it's populated by people we've never seen before. Was that your idea of a backhanded compliment? Nothing I ever do is backhanded. Surprisingly rational for a bunch of killers, the Sawyers agree to hand over Jeb, aka Leatherface. I guess it is a slightly better name than Tommy, but it's at this point a whole bunch of rednecks arrive, led by Burt Hartman, to hand out some old-fashioned southern justice, chucking Molotov cocktails into the house, and brutally slaughtering many of the Sawyers in a gunfight, and I'm not sure which is worse, the CGI blood or the CGI fire effects. So I guess the purpose of this opening sequence is designed to make us feel sorry for the killer cannibals who, in this movie's timeline just moments ago, murdered a group of innocent teens and then terrorized a young woman. But we're supposed to forget about all that now because they're fighting for family who technically didn't exist before. I know how critics like to say that in horror movies you root for the bad guys to kill people, but this might be the first one to actually do it intentionally. 
Seriously, you're making the cannibals the victims? As the farmhouse burns to the ground, which you can take as a metaphor if you like, Hooper confronts Bert about the killings. If this gets any more intense, they're gonna have a wig off. One of the hicks, Gavin Miller, goes into a nearby barn and finds wounded mother Loretta Sawyer. Again, not in the original movie. And her baby, also not in the original movie. Methinks they were reaching for cliches when they decided to make this a direct sequel. <laughs> And hey, if we can't make you feel sorry for the family by burning them alive, we'll throw in a random baby and have the mother kicked in the face. Alarm bells should already be going off. The Millers take in the child as their own, hiding it from the gang and ignoring the burn mark from her mother's S Sawyer necklace. The opening concludes with snapshots of the posse celebrating in the ashes, with the signature Texas Chainsaw snapshot sound effect played over, asking us who are the real murderers here? Those fucking cannibals! It Oh, uh, sorry, uh, excuse me, fellas, uh, <laughs> thought this was one of Phelous' videos. <laughs> what that gloriously sexy man said. And with that exit goes the best part of the review, so you can stop watching now, snob fans, and start bitching about how annoying Maddie's voice is, and how boring I am. Can I just say that he wrote that line? It's a knock against a fan base. of course I wrote that line. Wait till you see what I got lined up following Kara's fan base. Cut to the present day, and the baby is all grown up into the incredibly attractive Heather, first seen cutting meat in a supermarket, because subtlety. She's played by Alexandra Daddario of the Percy Jackson movies, and works alongside her friend Nikki, played by lost Tanya Raymond, all grown up, and damn does she look good, playing the typical horror slutty girl, because, again, subtlety. Heather's also an artist, purely so we can have her working with bones here. We get it, movie. Her boyfriend is Ryan, played by R&B singer Trey Songs, or Tremaine Nevisor, as his mum likes to call him. I love you, cutting your little birthmark. Mm. I don't know about you, but if I was that close to having sex with Alexander Daddario and Torbell, the phone, or even the fucking world was ending, I'd ignore it. Also, there's a wild difference between a birthmark and a scar, which that clearly is, by the way. Although, maybe you just didn't notice because it apparently never increased in size as she grew up. Only you could be that close to a woman's chest, and the focus of your attention would be on her scar. Heather gets news that her grandmother has died, one she never knew she had, and confronts her loving foster parents. Why couldn't you tell me? Tell you what, your mother has a defective uterus. I just want to know where I came from and who I came from. Well, we're the ones that raised you, and you were damn lucky, I'd say. You came from a shit heap. Now you know. You might have thought she caught on to the fact that they weren't her birth parents by the fact she looks and acts nothing like them, especially given that they probably didn't do it down the proper channels. ex nay the adoption agency, if you know what I mean. And are we meant to believe that she was raised in this kind of environment from childhood? I mean, I'm all for children rebelling against their roots, but generally if you're raised in a certain way, especially an abusive way, it will stick with you in later life. But if this is the movie trying to subtly say that she isn't a member of this family because she's nothing like them, and that she's a true Sawyer due to her working in the meat plant and working with bones, then shouldn't she be some sort of cannibal killer too? Which isn't very sympathetic given the circumstances. So it's left her in this state of limbo with no real identity at all. Wow, you really went off on one there, didn't you? About a year to think about it. The mind wanders. Luckily, her friends are really supportive and agree to come with her to visit her roots in Texas, including this bloke, Kenny, whose shirt has more personality than he does and is clearly there to add up the numbers. However, we've not quite got to all the fresh meat yet because at a quick petrol station stop on the way, they bump into a hitchhiker at Jump Scare O'Clock. You know, because there was one of those in the original. Do people usually walk around with their shirts half open in the pouring rain? Only if they have killer abs, apparently. Apparently. Yeah, but in that shirt, it doesn't exactly scream much, Joe, does it? Mm -hmm. Where are y'all headed? New Orleans. You're kidding. That's great. Now, where you going? Kinda. Newport. It's on the way. Where's your car? My lady dumped my butt and I've been thumbing my way back from Tulsa. I sure could use a ride. Okay. Yeah? Come on. I don't know about you, but I'm always picking up hitchhikers I've just knocked over. Can you even drive? It's a figure of speech. Please let me have this one. Please. Are you even old enough to watch this movie? Turn round, don't enter in. Lest the hand of the Almighty fall on you. He'll fuck you up. Yes, God will fuck you up. 
Really? That's the song choice you're going to use? That has to be an intentional laugh, surely. What do you think? I like it. Of course he does. So they arrive in New Texas, Nikki swaps tops to get her tits out again, and look an armadillo! You know, I'm not quite sure if we're watching a Texas Chainsaw movie yet. They arrive at Grandma Verna's huge mansion house and greeted by lawyer Farnsworth, played by Richard Reel, who is actually the most likable person in this movie, and he's got some good news, everyone! Oh, eight, nineteen. Best to remember it as a date. August 19th. Right. Verna used the date her family was brutally massacred as the password for a security system? Yeah, an interesting choice. I guess she was a fan of crowbarred exposition. The most important thing. It's from Verna. Make sure you read it. I will. Don't forget to read Verna's letter. You know, if somebody handed me a letter and told me to read it as soon as possible, I'd read it. But does she? Of course she doesn't, because it's only the most important thing. And if she did, we wouldn't have a movie. But we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. This is possibly the only part of the film I do like. The setting is a brilliantly eerie looking house. It's lit well, especially at night. And when Listen Hope takes his time, the film shines with suspense and clever camera angles. Sure, it's nothing groundbreaking or new, but it works for this film. I also like the little moments of Heather just walking through the house alone connecting with her history and we're left to interpret what she might be thinking and because the film is taking its time and we're not being dogged down by a bad script the silent moments mean much more than anything said out loud it's at this point i finally get to bring up the thing that's been bothering me throughout the entire movie if heather was born in 1973 and it's clearly 2012 because it says so on verna's headstone then how the hell is she being played by 20 something alexandra daddario i've got to say she is one sexy looking 39 year old Old, and I know some pretty foxy ladies in their 40s too, but I know Americans have this thing about casting older actresses and then casting them as younger characters, but a 27 year old playing a 39 year old? That's a new one on me. This isn't even a little thing, this is a fundamental plot hole that sinks the entire movie. They were two decades out. This movie had hundreds of people working on it. How do you miss a huge detail like this? Also, does anyone else find it weird that Granny has a pool table? I mean, did she like to fire a few shots off with Jeb? Or did she just know that five kids in their 20s or, I don't know, maybe in their 30s would just show up one day? Deciding the house is so great that they're going to stay, they head into town to get supplies, leaving the hitchhiker behind to take their bags and clean the house. Yes, you heard me. The guy they've just met and just picked up and just knocked over, by the way, is being trusted to stay alone in a house they've just discovered that's fully furnished and full of antiques. And to show how trusting, nay, stupid they are, they give him a key to every single room in said house. Oh, what a surprise! He's a thief who soon starts gladly plundering the silverware. Whilst there, he finds a pantry that itself leads down to a cellar, and that's where he finds a familiar metal sliding door with a tray of food out the front. And this is where suspense gets drained from the movie, because you know something is there, and this idiotic attempt to open the door just drains any of the suspense that could have been built up from the scene. Show him trying to open the door sure but to keep cutting back to him being a dick while talking to himself takes away any suspense <laughs> okay credit where it's due that was effective despite the soundtrack squeezing like a banshee Huh, do you think this movie objectifies women? Admittedly, it's hard to tell given that Nikki seems to be in heat in almost every scene she appears in and not very subtly flirting with Ryan when Heather's not looking. Real! Bryce Jack. What the fuck are you doing? <laughs> oh, he's looking. It was one time. One time. Come on, you begged for it. And now I'm begging you to keep your hands off my shit. Wow, they are so dead! And why has it become a horror film convention to make the entire cast unlikable assholes? Besides, boyfriend, black or white, who's been cheating on his girlfriend who happens to be the main character, he was dead as soon as this realization was revealed. Spoilers! Oh, like we got like, surprised when this happens later on in the film. She might as well have dead meat plastered over her amazing breasts. While in town, Heather first encounters local cop Carl, played by Scott Eastwood, yes, Clint's son, and Bert, now the town's mayor, who immediately wants to buy the property off her. Yo! Oh. Oh shit. Fucking thief. Yes, I'm shocked too. How could they not expect I mean, let someone into your life and then they break your heart, tear down the walls and leave you emotionally crippled. We are talking about the film, right? Of course. Okay, okay, okay. Just checking, just checking. 
Instantly, this character, the Hitchhike, will never be brought up again. Well, that character was completely useless. They kind of forget about the robbery and start to party, because if there's one thing modern horror movie characters do, it's party. Because that's pretty much all they're ever written to do. And I really like this shot of Heather comparing his scar in the picture's reflection. In a much better film, a shot and image like this could have been a really effective moment. While cooking on the grill, we get it! Kenny nurses the door into the pantry and down to the cellar, looking for the Hitchhike. Hitchhiker, even though the bloodstain clearly indicates something is very wrong, even waltzing into Leatherface's dungeon and soon gets himself attacked with a hook in the back for his troubles in 3D. If you're a fan of the original, you have no doubt picked up on the subtle references in the way the characters are being dispatched, with the first victims in both films being bludgeoned by a hammer and the second victims being hit in the back with a hook. And seriously, no one heard his screams of terror? I know it's a big house, but just because they're playing loud music doesn't mean they've all suddenly gone deaf, especially since we couldn't hear it all in the background. Nikki runs into the house, screaming to Ryan she's seen something totally fucked up. Leading us to believe that she's seen Kenny, she actually leads him to the barn, where she stashed away some tequila for a roll in the hay. You know, there is such a thing as being too obvious, especially when your best friend, who is also his girlfriend, is in the house. There's Keen, and then there's fucking stupid. Guess which side of the fence Nikki falls on. Heather's still upstairs, where there's an astonishingly lame jump scare as Heather closes the door to find Velma's body in her chair, having been dug up and placed there by Leatherface. When did Leatherface manage to dig up and place Verna's corpse in the half an hour they went to town, and why? I know it's a certain a sequence later in the film, but this doesn't make any sense, especially as Heather would be able to smell a month-old dead body before she even and saw it. She rushes downstairs to warn her friends, but no one is around, and she runs into the kitchen to find... After two reveals for Leatherface in this film so far, I kind of like the flip of the whole thing and that this is his official reveal and it's just so casual. It's unexpected and it really sort of takes away the whole mythological side of it, which is what so many horror films and remakes are guilty of when it comes to these characters. Because he's preparing literal finger food. Even this intensely dark humour, this is some seriously goofy shit. I shouldn't be in hysterics when the murderer arrives on screen. I didn't say I liked what he was doing. I said I liked the casual reveal. If you're going to start nitpicking my commentary, then me and you are going to have words. Don't we always have words? Maybe. Don't you always win? Yes. Fuck. Leatherface grabs Heather and throws her against a table, knocking her out. She awakens in Leatherface's dungeon, where he's chopped limbs for no apparent reason and is hanging Kenny back on a hook. <laughs> Overkill, I see what they're doing here. Hey, can you imagine in the first film if they went to each other, after he's put her on the hook, maybe we should soar in half. It makes it instantly ten times more scary. Yeah, especially as a 3D money shot. Good thing that chainsaw quarterized him though, that could have caused a hell of a mess. As this version of Leather Fist has never heard of restraining his victims, Heather easily runs off again. Do you know what I love in horror films? When the person running away falls over. <laughs> Hey, at least she fell down something as opposed to just falling over for the hell of it. And this time she fell over something. I still stand by everything I've said. And you know what's the best place to hide from a chainsaw wielding serial killer? A confined place like Verna's coffin. What's that? This is a really stupid idea because he can hear you whimpering and you can't escape? This whole sequence is based around a tacky 3D POV shot of the chainsaw cutting into the lid? It's a good thing then that Heather has some equally dumb cheating friends. Who is that? Hey! Hey! Oh. Up. Look at that conviction. You know, I know I'd look that disinterested too if a madman was coming at me with a chainsaw after sawing into a grave. You're all right there, Ted. He's a fair bit away yet. And how do they only just hear any of this? Maybe they were being extra loud themselves? Bravo! Ryan spends a disproportionate amount of time trying to lock the wooden barn door. Uh, you do know that chainsaws can cut through that, right? <laughs> Texas, motherfucker. He comes from Texas. You don't. You don't get 
prepared to do that one-liner. Luckily, Heather smashes in with the van and picks them both up and drive off to escape. Unfortunately, Ryan is a bloody idiot who decides instead of waiting for the reinforced gate to open, he'll just try and ram it apart, thereby slowing them down enough for Leatherface to catch up with them again. Do you ever wonder why the audience might not be able to identify or even sympathise with this group? You've got the boyfriend and the best friend who are cheating, and then the movie seems to expect the audience to sympathise with them when they're in a life and death situation. They manage to scrape through, but stall long enough for Leatherface to cut one of the tyres. <laughs> I will flip the whole van over, and even more hilariously, this is how they kill Ryan, who cut his neck open on the windshield during the crash. Bless you, cheating six-pack. Your subplot of sleeping with the best friend will have no payoff and never be mentioned again. Leatherface attacks and channels Rob Zombie's Michael Myers by flipping the van over with his bare hands, which isn't bad considering he's something like 70 years old at this point. He manages to slice Nikki across the stomach, but Heather manages to escape, and we get the now standard Texas chase through the woods, which, as you'd expect, is full of music and quick cutting, everything that the original did not have. This leads to the earlier talked about Halloween Carnival, where absolutely no one seems to care that there's a blood-soaked woman being chased by a chainsaw-wielding maniac. Maybe they're British. And look! A chainsaw-wielding kid dressed up like Jig so, seriously, guys? Fuck you. Jigsaw's better than this. Thankfully, some people do actually start to panic, getting Carl's attention, even if Leatherface is still single-mindedly after Heather, who climbs onto a moving Ferris wheel as Leatherface just keeps revving up impotently. How long do chainsaws run anyway? Stop the fucking door! <laughs> It's cheesy, but I always love a good tacky 3D gimmick shot. Although, seriously, what was with Leatherface's arms as he ran away? <laughs> and there goes one of horror's most iconic characters ever. It's kind of symbolic when you think about it, isn't it? I need a drink. <laughs> we'll be right back. So Heather is taken off to the police station, and <laughs> I, I'm no doctor, but shouldn't they take her to the hospital first? I mean, she's clearly dramatised and covered in blood. That should be the first port of call. She recounts what happened to Sheriff Hooper, who is reminded of what happened to all those years ago. Mayor Burt confronts Hooper, but they're interrupted by a cop investigating the crash site, who finds no bodies, but plenty, my god, plenty of blood. Oh, Officer Marvin, I have fond memories of you. Hooper tells him to wait, but Marvin's got a hunch, and Burt tells him to proceed anyway, because this is Texas, son. You got a piece, you got all the backup you need. In the film's most side-splittingly hysterical sequence, Marmon goes into the house, not only following that ridiculously huge blood trail, but actually simulcasting to Hooper and Bert over FaceTime. The human body does not contain that much blood. You finish that line, and I'll finish you. But I... Ah! Fine. Well, if I can't say that, then what I will say is like they got a mop and slid it round the house, and this protracted scene only gets funnier the longer it goes on. Which is a very long time, because how fucking big is this house? Not to mention his unintentionally uproarious commentary. Following the blood. Getting a bad feeling here. Still following the blood. Ladies' makeup. What a fruitcake. He eventually finds the bodies deep in Leatherface's den, including for some reason a decapitated Ryan. And it looks like, once again, Leatherface has put something, or someone, in the freezer. <laughs> Another homage to the first film, and the first film did it better. Look, Aliens proved it is possible to pay homage to a scene from the original and make it better. Sadly, this film is not Aliens. I don't know what you're saying. That was a brilliant tribute to that scene in Burn After Reading where Brad Pitt gets his head blown off. Seriously, this movie misses true calling as a comedy. The call immediately cuts off, and naturally, Marvin has a rather nasty encounter with Leatherface. While this has been going on, Heather's been sat waiting and kept herself occupied with the giant box of evidence about the soy murders that they just left out like professional police officers. It's there she discovers the horrifying truth about what happened, how she was the baby taken from the scene, that the Millers were part of the mob, and that her family was brutally eczema scared. Ah yes, those poor cannibal murderers. And it's nice that they have such respect for the audience that they either blur or crop out the year to try and make us forget the timeline flaw. Oh, except for that one. I want to see the soy girl. She's a victim, Bert. She hasn't done anything. She's free, the nation! 
Now, I know what you're thinking, Bert. You have no idea. I don't think even the scriptwriters knew what they were doing at this point. So, let me get this straight. Bert wants to kill Heather because she's a blood relative of Leatherface, even though otherwise she has no connection to him? Why? What does he hope to gain from this? And if Cooper hadn't left out the confidential reports, then she wouldn't have even known about the cover-up. And isn't there like a hulking, mass-murdering seven-footer running around that they should be more worried about? Yeah, he's no AP, but he's still dangerous. And again, the movie makes the fatal mistake of demystifying Leatherface. Yeah, but next to the rest of the character derailment, this seems almost minor by comparison. Yeah, I know. But still, we're treated to yet another rendition of Leatherface creating his mask out of Marvin's face. Not only does it feel like it's pandering to gorehounds lingering over the process, but it's other otherwise completely gratuitous filler. And at the end of it, the fresh mask still looks the damn same. Edda sets up a meeting with Farnsworth at a local bar, who is amazed to learn she didn't read the letter like instructed. Although, to be fair, he was omitting a few details. The person in the basement is Jedediah Sawyer. Goes by Jed. He's your cousin. For years I suspected something, but I never knew for sure about Jed until about four months ago, when Verna presented him to me. Grown man with the emotions of an eight-year-old. Frankly, you're scared the shit out of me. Of course he did! A huge hulking dude wearing a fucking skin mask! How exactly do you introduce someone like that in the middle of an afternoon chat? And I had no idea that Leatherface and the Sawyers were this well off. I mean... If they had a family member with a house this size, then why were they living out in the sticks? The barman rats out Heather, who grabs a knife and exits, but is abruptly stopped when Townie Ollie runs her down. I got her, Bert! You going somewhere precious? Huh? Ow! She cut! Bert! Have you ever been knocked over by a car? No, but I was knocked over by a bus. Really? And did you... did you just run away? No, I must say I limped home very, very, very slowly, because, you know, it hurts. She flags down Carl on the street and allows him to pick her up, because, as already been proven in this town, the police are totally trustworthy. She asks him to take her back to the bar where Farnsworth is, but he drives on anyway because, and this may surprise you, he's a bad guy. Yep. Saw you girls loose. She's headed towards town. Yeah, yeah, I got her. What do you want me to do with her? Take her up to the slaughterhouse and hold her. You got it, Dad. That's your fucking dad! Open the door, you liar! How is he a liar? It's not like he never told her he wasn't his father. And the first time they met, Bert put his arm around him and almost everyone knew they were related. I think you're a little bit slow on the uptake, Heather. So you're a Hartman, huh? Yep. I'm a Sawyer. So I guess it goes to show, it doesn't matter how or where you're raised, if your family, whom you knew nothing about, are killer cannibals, then I guess you're a killer cannibal too. So fuck trying to better yourself, just roll over and accept it. And good job sticking the knife in the window, thereby wasting a perfectly good concealed weapon. Not like that could be handy. Hooper uses the radio to try and tell Marvin to go to the slaughterhouse, but just informs Leatherface where to go for revenge. Even though in the very next scene, he only just realises where Carl's taking Heather. Oh, for Pete's sake, they put the scenes in the wrong order. And why is he radioing Marvin anyway? He hasn't radioed back for hours, and the last time you saw him, he was wandering into a slaughter den. He's pretty obviously dead, dude. Carl hangs up Heather waiting for its father to arrive, and for some reason has decided to take her bra off, probably because this movie didn't feel sleazy enough. Oh, and once Bert does arrive, Carl's dismissed, never to be seen again. Bye! Inside, Leatherface appears, and in a moment, completely out of character for what's been established in the original and this film so far, he places the chainsaw on her shoulder to threaten her rather than just kill her. Because now, if you needed to be told, Leatherface is the good guy, so he doesn't kill on sight unless you count all the other times he killed on sight. But then this movie doesn't even know what century it's in, so who am I to complain? The purpose of this is, of course, so he can finally see her birthmark, which is the combination of her running around with her shirt open, and presumably why her bra's gone. And again, I find myself not complaining about this. It's a shame they went to such lengths to conceal her breasts. I mean, my head could have used quite the workout. You do know that sounds like, right? Yes, I do. Why do you think I wrote it? Bloody Welshman. Mm. Welsh. 
Leatherface starts to free her, but is attacked by Ollie and Bert, and somehow Heather manages to get away despite not having her second restraint cut. Leatherface is continually beaten by Ollie and Bert with a pipe, as he lies prone on the floor pathetically, whilst they taunt him and wrap a chain leading to a meat processor around his neck, essentially lynching him. Huh, they are turning Leatherface, one of the most iconic horror monsters of all time, into the victim. I am so done. In their excitement, they completely forgot there was a second person they were attacking, and Heather comes back and pitchforks Ollie. Hey! Look who's back. That's right. Do your thing, cuz. Oh my god. I think I just threw up in my mouth. Do you remember when Alexia teamed up with the Predator in Alien vs. Predator and managed to strip away any fear or aura the Predator ever had? Yeah, I reviewed it. This is worse. Oh, yeah. So suddenly, when you give him back his chainsaw, he apparently gets a second win Popeye style, and he throws off the chain, having a chainsaw versus crowbar battle that is just as cringeworthy as it sounds. Hooper comes in just as Leatherface cuts Bert's ankles, but doesn't actually do anything as Leatherface starts to back Bert into the processor, and if you think the CGI gore looks horrendous now, wait until he cuts Bert's hands off. <laughs> Bad CGI. What did they do that affected? MS Paint? <laughs> to boldly flee had better special effects than this. <sighs> do you have to do this to me? I like being employed by Channel Awesome. Look, look, if anyone gets reprimanded for this, it'll be me. It's always me, isn't it, Rob? Can't get around the good book, Bert. Clean this shit up. I want to know how they intend to explain this to the townspeople. Leatherface did just kill the mayor. When you think about it, Hooper's a really shitty cop. He watched the soils get slaughtered, he left evidence in front of a witness, and he just let a mass murderer kill someone and go free. This guy isn't the good cop, he's the worst. Having avenged the massacre, Leatherface walks home with Heather, who has accepted her place in the family. Despite the fact that, you know, he brutally murdered all of her friends mere hours ago. She forgot about that incredibly quickly, but given how forgettable her friends were in regards to the story, I guess she could be forgettable given for that? With the dust settled and the uh, other villains who are not cannibals now dead, she finally reads the note. In another of those, see, we like the original nods, while almost completely missing everything that made the original so memorable, Werner is played by Marlon Burns, who played heroine Sally in the first film, with the note explaining everything that Heather has now already learned by herself like an idiot. So really, this whole thing has been Heather's fault. If she just read the letter to begin with, then all her friends would still be alive, be able to continue their cheating ways. I know, exactly! Hey, I wonder what this movie would play like if she actually read the letter at the time. Don't forget to read Werner's letter. The large key opens the fortified door to the wine cellar. There, you will discover a metal door. Behind it lives your cousin. And that's how the movie ends, with Heather accepting her birthright as a murderer and caretaker to a mentally challenged killer psychopath who likes to wear other people's faces. So, uh, what's she gonna do for work? Or shop around town? Or just have a life in general? She doesn't have a brother as far as we're aware, unless the film wants to make up another family member. So does this mean she's gonna have to breed with Leatherface to keep the line running? Because, honestly, that's a sequel I'd rather not see. Oh, and there's a dumb post credit scene where the Millers visit the house to try and get her money, and Leatherface comes out to presumably kill them. So the moral of the story is, it's okay to murder your foster parents and shelter your insane cousin who killed all your friends, because it's still better than a vigilante mob. Wait, what? What are you doing? Oh, I'm checking the comments on the video. Oh, really? What do they say? Not the usual. Your voice is annoying. I'm annoying. When's my soul retrospective being completed? They thought I'd left the site. Why are we so mean to Linkara? Why are we so mean to Linkara's fans? Fat Grandma's awesome, Fat Grandma sucks, and it's offensive for some reason. And why am I being so mean to you in this review? They really said all that? Well, they will. Texas Chainsaw 3D is a travesty. For a movie that clearly wants to recapture the spirits of the original, they couldn't have understood less what made it tick. Instead, they slap on the references and cameos, and the first half feels like they're adhering to the series formula because they have to, seeing the way that almost the entire supporting cast of underdeveloped, unlikable characters are quickly slain in around 10 minutes at the midway point. But then you get into the Texan Justice subplot, which is an idea so horribly miscarried 
calculates that it seems to turn into a completely different film, with a resolution that is frankly baffling. And let's not get into the terrible production values, not least the CGI work or the moronic script that can't even count. It's a lot more fun than the beginning, but that's only because it's sunk even lower into outright incompetence. It's a weird collection of horror, farce, parody, torture, slasher and camp, and it doesn't know where it really wants to settle. There are moments of true horror brilliance and moments of suspense, but then you have completely unmotivated moments and the utterly stupid decision to make the Sawyers and Leatherface the victims. There is a reason that films like Halloween, Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street and the Texas Chainsaw movies managed to endure with multiple sequels for so many years, and this is because the monsters in them remained monsters. The beginning was Leatherface's origin story which was bad enough, but what could be worse than discovering why Leatherface is the way he is? Making him the hero of the movie. There's a finite difference between a horror movie monster like Leatherface and a human horror movie monster like Jigsaw. And even with Tobin Bell's performance, at no point Point, did Saw ever make Jigsaw the hero? When these films take horror monsters of the past and make them into the heroes of today, it strips away all form of mystery and fear which is what makes them appealing to the public. Which is why this version was doomed from the first five minutes and why so many horror franchise remakes these days very rarely get third sequels. I'm Matthew Buck, beating down bad movies everywhere. And I'm Welshy, and after picking apart many a beloved channel awesome producer and fan base, in a completely unscripted and series of events, because naturally everything we do in front of a camera is unscripted, I can honestly say I feel a whole lot better. Honestly, remind me again when you're leaving, because it can't come fast enough. Leaving? Dude, I've already left. Oh yeah? Then why are you still here? Sorry, I thought we were done.